Today's episode is brought to you by BCB Group. You're going to be hearing more about them later on in the show. But for now, here's my conversation with Jim Bianco. A note is that we filmed this on March 9th, the day before uh, Red Hot Inflation Print uh, triggered the Federal Reserve to issue some forward guidance. And that, of course, rocked the fixed income markets to its core, caused one of the most violent re-ratings on the front end of the yield curve since the great financial crisis. It's really good to get Jim's view a day before this happened because he kind of predicted it all. Uh, let's just say his worldview has been so far validated. I think Jim's got a really uh, good handle on these markets. Of course, we talk about inflation, the yield curve, and the impact on the equity market. Much, much more as well, of course. Hope you enjoy this conversation with Jim Bianco. Really excited to have Jim Bianco of Bianco Research here. Jim, welcome to Forward Guidance. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Me too, Jim. I love your analysis. Let's get right into it. And I think that probably about four months ago, Jim, the question was, is the Fed going to hike in 2022? Not how many hikes, but is the Fed going to hike? Now the question is not whether the Fed is going to hike, but how many? And specifically, is it going to be five? Is it going to be six? Is it going to be seven? Jim, how do you think that dynamic, that, that shift, uh, to what degree is that responsible for, for changes that we've seen in the market now? I think the priority is inflation. It is no longer growth. And I think people are having a hard time understanding that the priority is inflation and not growth. And if the priority is inflation, the Federal Reserve is going to have to react aggressively to dealing with this inflation problem. They're going to raise rates a lot. History has shown that when the Fed starts raising rates, they have a big problem. They don't know when to stop. They usually stop after they break something over and over again. Now, breaking something can mean markets plunge and they hit whatever the strike price is of the pile put. Economies go into recession or dramatically slow down. Or the plumbing of the financial system breaks. Um, like the repo market in 2019, you can ask Joseph Wang to tell you all about that one uh, as well, too. But something breaks. Typically, when the Fed starts raising rates, the yield curve starts to flatten, which is what it's doing now. When the yield curve inverts, as long as the yield curve is still a freely traded instrument, meaning that it's market players making judgments on where interest rates should be, and the reason I say that is because of QE, you could make a case it's no longer freely traded or it's partially freely traded. And I'm open to that idea. But when the yield curve inverts, it has been eight for eight in predicting recessions. When it refers, when it's been, you know, you have to go back at least to the early 60s, late 50s to maybe find a, a yield curve inversion that didn't predict a recession. But back then, they did have what was called Operation Twist and the yield curve was not freely traded. And the reason is, so when the yield curve inverts, that is a signal to you and me that the Fed's gone too far with their rate hikes. They've pushed up short rates too much above long rates and something's broken. Now, it may not be obvious the day that the yield curve inverts, but soon thereafter, it will be. Markets plunge, the economy goes into recession or some dramatically slows down. Something like the repo market or the plumbing of the markets break or something like that. So I suspect what you're going to see with this new priority the Fed's going to be aggressive on raising rates. The long end will trade sideways, which is what it typically does. Yeah, it might breach 2%, might go as high as two and a quarter, maybe, but it isn't going to three. Uh, and what you could see happen is it will trade sideways and the two-year note will go up through two and it will invert the yield curve. That will be a signal something's broken. Because the Fed won't know when to stop. They won't know how much they're supposed to raise rates in order to rein in inflation without breaking something. They did the last time um, as well, too. They rose rates nine times. They got it to two and three eighths by, um, by the peak. And then the repo market broke. Uh, and then we had a recession. Although, yeah, the pandemic might be, but it was the pandemic that caused the recession. Yeah, we don't know what would have happened outside the pandemic, but there was indications that the economy was slowing before the pandemic. But I'll admit we, that we don't know what the counterfactual would, would have been without the pandemic. But nevertheless, the yield curve did invert right before yet another recession, keeping its perfect streak intact. In so I suspect that that's really what I'm looking for. And as the curve continues, to me, as a bond guy, you know, I look at the 10-year going sideways. I look at the two-year note going up. 
But I'm not watching 58 basis points, the difference between the two-year and the 10-year, getting ever narrower and narrower and narrower. And as it starts making its march, continuing its march, it was 150 a year ago. It's 58 now. As it makes its march towards zero and inverted, that's to telling me that we're getting closer and closer to something breaking. And last thought for you on this. Are you saying that all they have to do is take the funds rate to 2% and that would be enough to break something? Yes, because one people... One of the arguments you'll hear on the growth side uh, of things, Eric Peters of One River Asset put it out this weekend. And, and what he was 100% right when he said, you know, 30 trillion of debt and all of the uh, and all the leverage in the system. There's no way the Fed could raise rates enough to deal with inflation. They're going to have to do less. He's right. But I think the priority of the Fed is not growth, because that's what he was arguing, is inflation. And I think that all because of what he said, they, they raise rates six or seven times, get interest rates near two and invert the curve. That might be all you need to break things. You don't need to bring interest rates back to 5% to break things. You might look, two and three eighths broke the repo market. So 2% might be all you need. So if we're talking about five, six, seven rate hikes over the next year and a half, that might be enough to do it. And what you've seen for the last five months is the market prices in ever more rate hikes. And you're right, we're between five and six now for this calendar year. And the consensus is always behind. And it keeps trying to catch up. And we call it the parlor game of how many rate hikes do you think we're going to have? That's because they're always behind the market and they have to catch up with the market. So a month ago, if you were predicting three rate hikes, you were one rate hike behind the market. Now you're potentially three, and you just have to continue to keep catching up. And Jim, when you say the market, who are you, you talking about? Because I know you, you can sort of slice and dice them into different players. There's the, there's the you know, interest rate traders, and then there's the general consensus, then there's the, the, the strategists. So you know, when, when people say, Jim, and I know you, you've heard this a lot, oh, the Fed can't hike, they're going to they're gonna break something, so five rate hikes is totally off the table – that seems like, quote, the consensus. However, if you look at interest rate markets, which is also the market, like six rates hikes are, are priced in. So who's right and who is the market? Yeah, so let's start with the first half. Who is the market? I tend to break the market down into three groups. There are short-term debt traders, people that trade T-bills, repo, people that trade Fed fund futures, euro dollars, LIBOR. They have the closest ear to the Fed because Fed policy matters the most to them. They are the ones that price in what the Fed fund futures or over index, overnight index swaps or the euro dollar futures markets are saying. If you go to CME Fed Watch on Google, the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has a nice little clean tool that will tell you what the Fed fund futures is priced in. And they all pretty much say the same thing. That has six rate hikes priced in or five to six rate hikes priced in for this year. But then if you ask long-term debt traders, people that trade 10-year or 30-year bonds, or equity traders, or f international or global investors, no, no, they can't, they can't go that much. They won't go that much. So that's the disconnect because normally you would say whatever the market is priced in, that's dead center consensus. But this is a rare period where what the market is priced in is not dead center consensus. It is for your dollar T-bill traders, but for the equity in the long-term bond traders, they're, they're still thinking the Fed's going to go a lot less. And you're right. Why do they think they're going to go a lot less? And I've argued it's about what you think the priority of the Fed is. Now, mo for, for the last 13 years, the priority of the Fed has been growth. How do we grow the economy? How do we get the unemployment rate as low as possible? Uh, this is what the Fed refers to as their new framework that they adopted in September 2020. And so people have looked at Fed policy and they've said when the Fed raises rates, how far can they raise rates to not impair growth? And to this day, everybody still believes that. I shouldn't say everybody, but the vast majority still believe that. But I would argue to you, the game's changed. 
Now the priority of the Fed is inflation. And it's what do they need to do to rein in inflation? And to that end, that's why I think the short-term debt traders get it. The Fed's going to have to go five or six times. Look, why does the Fed raise rates if they're worried about inflation? It is precisely to slow down growth. It is precisely to hit the markets. That is the goal of raising rates. But a lot of people are like, no, they can't. They can't be hitting the markets. They can't make my job hard. They have to, you know, you know, th that's what they they keep pushing back on. So it is that is if inflation is the priority, that is precisely the goal is to make markets miserable. And that's what I fear is the the priority is inflation. And in that prior world where growth is the priority of the Federal Reserve, that's a world where a 20% drawdown in the stock market, a 15% drawdown, even a 10% drawdown is something to make the Fed chair get out of bed and, and maybe reverse course. But you're saying in this new inflationary world, the Powell put is, has a much lower strike price. Exactly right. A exactly right. You know, if you want to put it in market terms, is the strike price has been lowered and it's been lowered quite a bit. Uh, and the question is, why is inflation now the priority and not growth? And I think it's about politics. And uh, by the way, most money managers that I talk to, they're pretty bad at predicting politics. They either don't want to do it or don't believe it matters or they're partisan in some way and they don't want to let it show one way or the other. Uh, but as a group, as a group, Get five money managers in a room or 10 money managers in a room. Ask them about what they, who they think is going to win the election. Take the other side. You'll be Nostradamus is basically the way that that, that crowd typically works. And you know what? They'll tell you that too. The problem now is with inflation, it hits everybody. Inflation. You, me, everybody listening to this podcast is hit by inflation. However, there's a big difference. The, uh, the survey of consumer finances says uh, that the Federal Reserve study done every three years that 40 percent of the public has less than a thousand dollars of savings in rents. So when prices, seven percent inflation goes up more than wages, which has been the case, so you have negative real wages, they the 40 percent see it at the grocery store, at the gas pump, at the mall, every single time they go to the store and they're not happy about it. And that is showing up in things like consumer confidence, the University of Michigan's consumer sentiment surveys at a 10-year low, a 10-year low. Uh, the president's approval rating is in the tank. Congress's approval rating is in the tank. Uh, the, and the Democrats are panicking because the Democrats are the majority. So we're going to look at it from their point of view. They're panicking that they're going to get wiped out in November. And so when asked in a lot of surveys, what is the number one issue in the country? It is inflation. It is not crime. It is not COVID. It is not foreign policy or Russia. It is not climate change. It's none of those things. It is inflation. It's the number one issue. So in last month's press, conf uh, press conference, President Biden's press conference, he acknowledged inflation is the biggest issue in the country today. Now, the second challenge we're facing are prices. And he said, in two sentences, he said, here's what we're going to do about it. This is President Biden speaking. Here's what we're going to do about it. The job to make sure inflation does not become entrenched falls to the Federal Reserve. A critical job in making sure that the elevated prices don't become entrenched rests with the Federal Reserve. In other words, he said, America, you're pissed off about inflation. You hate us about inflation. Well, here's what we're going to do about it. There's this guy named Jay Powell. He's going to fix it for you. And by God, Jay Powell is going to fix the inflation problem. And if equity holders or bondholders have a problem with it, you have a problem with it. The, pr the priority now is inflation. That's a great metaphor. And Jim, how do you think that the Federal Reserve goes about tightening monetary policy? Because it doesn't just go out and hike rates. The Fed doesn't like to, to spook markets. They do so by sort of, you know, a, a wink and a nod and, and saying statements that it, only people who are paying really close attention like you, like you get, um, you know, that, that typically is called forward guidance, which is actually the, you know, the name of this podcast 
Uh, we've seen a, a rise in short-term rates, and some could say that that is in anticipation of Federal Reserve hikes. Now, others could say the market is hiking, uh, is tightening monetary conditions for the Fed instead of the Fed. How do you think about that? I, I noticed that you, you wrote um, something to the effect of uh, uh, they, they still think that the Fed is under control in the short end, but I think it's the short end controlling the Fed. What do you mean by that? There was a uh, a Dallas Fed president uh, named Bob McTeer around 99, 2000. And he said that only hawks go to central bank heaven. And a lot of those Federal Reserve officials believe that true. This is the moment they live for. This is your Volcker moment. Take rates to the moon. Break the back of inflation. You will go to central bank heaven. You knuckle under and just keep feeding the punch bowl in the middle of an inflationary period. You're going to go to central bank hell is where you're going to go at that point. So I do think they've gotten their marching orders. They are predisposed to fight inflation anyway. And now for the first time in 40 years, we've got it. And they're going to do it in a big way. And the market's sitting there going, no, they can't. They can't do that. They can't raise rates that much. They can't impair things. I think they will. So you think that the market that is pricing in five to six rate hikes for, for this year, do you think that uh, is... Uh, correct, and maybe you think it's it's actually uh, too dovish. You think maybe you think they can hike more. And also, you say only uh, only hawks go to central bank heaven. I'd say doves have more fun while they're on this earth. And Jim, also, I would say that hawks they you know sometimes get bricks thrown through their window. And perhaps you can uh, you know share with our audience uh, the anec- anecdote about uh, Paul Volcker in the the resistance that he got. Yeah, so um, they can do more. They can also do quantitative tightening. Um, Let me, a lot of people, I'm going to say this a little differently and I'll explain it. The Fed was buying $220 billion worth of bonds a month and they're tapering that to $100 billion of bonds a month. Wait a minute, I thought it was 120 to zero. But there's another $100 billion in there that is every, the Fed has nearly a $9 trillion portfolio of securities. They're almost, you know, they're a little smaller than BlackRock, if you want to put it in those terms. <laughs> and about $100 billion worth of securities every month matures. So they then buy $100 billion on top of that just to offset the maturing securities. And then they were buying another $120 billion to expand the balance sheet. So on March 1st, when they go to zero on the expansion, they're still buying $120 billion of security. I mean, excuse me, $100 billion of securities a month. They'll eventually, under quantitative tightening, take that down to zero. And that would be the reduction of the balance sheet by a trillion dollars a year or so that everybody's looking at. So they're not going to be... The reason I went through that mechanics is they don't have to sell anything. They just have to stop replenishing maturing securities and that's how they're going to wind up doing that, too. And then we'll start this parlor game. We haven't yet is how much of a reduction is a trillion dollars of balance sheet reduction, the equivalent of two rate hikes or three rate hikes or one rate hike, you know, on top of the other five that they're going to do. So there can be more that they're going to wind up doing. As far as your question about the late 70s, um, One of the things that makes people think hawks go to heaven and everybody has awe for the hawks is in the late 70s, we had high inflation. And the response by Volcker was to jack up interest rates. And I know some people won't believe this unless you've lived it or you've looked it up. The funds rate got to 21.5% by 1980, 21.5%. And that created a firestorm in the country. And a lot of people don't realize what happened was farmers went with their tractors that sound like Ottawa today. Farmers went with their tractors to Washington, D.C. and blockaded the Federal Reserve Building. Volcker couldn't go to work. Builders would mail two by fours to the Federal Reserve chairman. Thousands of them were because I don't need them. You're killing the housing industry. So I'm going to just mail them to you. A crazy guy with a shotgun and a knife broke into the Federal Reserve Building in, in December of 81, yeah, this actually happened, and wanted to take the FOMC hostage, force them to lower interest rates, and put them on trial for treason. He was apprehended by security on the second floor of the building, 
down the hall from the meeting room where they hold the FOMC meeting. Yeah, people get pretty worked up about inflation and about higher interest rates, but really worked up about inflation. You think they get worked up about, uh, uh, you know, the falling stock prices and where the put is? That's romper room compared to where they got worked up with on inflation. And the Fed knows this. And the Fed knows that this is why they cannot ignore inflation. I thought the reason that the, the truckers were sending the, the two by fours and all this pushback was because Volcker jacked up rates. So they weren't revolting against inflation. They were revolting against the cure uh, for inflation, right? It, it's, two, it's two sides of the same coin. Before yeah. Volcker came in and you had um, Arthur Burns as the Federal Reserve chairman, they were doing, you know, to put it in modern, modern terms, more like Erdogan, right? You know, here's high inflation and what are we going to do? We're going to print more money so that we can deal with high inflation. Well, we weren't printing money, but we were very, very slow in addressing the inflation problem under Arthur Burns. He left in 1978, Paul Volcker came in, and then Volcker finally said, look, the response to inflation is massively higher interest rates. So people were, you're right, they were responding to high rates, but the catalyst for those high rates was inflation. Just like I'm saying now, the catalyst for five or six rate hikes and much higher interest rates is going to be inflation. And people are going to get very, very upset about it because this is what inflation does. If the answer is 7% inflation, well, you know, we got to go total Erdogan here, you know, the, in, the, the president of Turkey and say, what are we going to do? They have 50% inflation. What are we going to do about that? Well, we'll print money and, and send people money so they can afford stuff. The, the, the cure to inflation is low rates. Yeah, exactly. So this is the this is the problem the Fed is in. I know everybody wants to know what is the magic policy that gets rid of inflation and produces a 5000 S&P. Um, you don't have one. You got to pick one or the other. And, you know, uh, so they got to, you know, to use a survivor analogy, they got to vote one of these guys off the island. And I think that they're going to vote the stock market off the island. They're going to vote growth off the island. They're going to decide with inflation. They have to deal with that. Let me put this in the context. My prices are going up 7%. Your prices are going up 7%. Now, maybe I didn't get a 7% raise this year. Or you didn't get a 7% raise. But we own assets. We have maybe have a stock portfolio. We maybe own a home. Um, we may own have a, other investments and I might look and say, prices are up 7%, but my paycheck's not up 7%. But boy, look how much my house went up. My stock portfolio did crappy. It was only up 25% when the S&P was up 29%. Uh, you know, some other investments I have went up. My net worth, my net financial position is better now than a year ago. So I'm okay with this inflation thing. But if you don't have assets like a home or a stock portfolio, all you have is a paycheck, and every month that paycheck buys you less. You are worse off every single month, and that's why you see the consumer confidence numbers. If I said in isolation, if I was to show you, here's the consumer confidence numbers, here's the president's approval rating, here's Congress's approval rating, and the public thinks the number one issue in the country is economic inflation, just those inputs, you'd say the economy's in recession. And but we're nowhere near recession. Wall Street keeps talking about how great the economy is by their metrics. They're right. But by the public's metrics, they think this economy is awful right now. And it's really been driven by inflation. And that's why the Fed has no choice. They have to address that issue. They cannot address that issue by making you and me richer, saying, let's make the, let's take the S&P to 5200 and all those people working at near minimum wage or minimum wage jobs. You just hang in there. If I just make Jack and Jim rich enough, it'll all trickle down to you. That ain't going to work. They're going to have to deal with the inflation issue. This episode is brought to you by BCB Group, Europe's leading provider of crypto-friendly business banking for institutions in the crypto space. They also provide trading services, allowing you to trade FX and cryptocurrency quickly and at scale. They specialize in efficient execution of large orders in illiquid markets. So if you are an institution looking to make high volume trades, you need to check out BCB Group because a great trade idea is worth nothing if you can't execute it. And that is exactly what BCB Group helps you to do. 
Their mission is to empower the global financial revolution through sustainable and innovative banking. Really glad to have them as a sponsor. So if you want to take control of your digital assets, please check them out at bcbgroup.com slash Jack. That's bcbgroup.com slash Jack. Thank you. And let's get back to the show. Jim, uh, a casual observer of, of news about the labor market would note that a lot of stories that people who folks who were earning minimum wage, which you know I believe is seven twenty five an hour, now they're being paid fifteen dollars an hour. They're you know starting salaries of at eighteen dollars an hour, and then on the high end you have stories of folks who are getting out of college and you know they're doing a a Wall Street a banking first year analyst job and they're being paid one hundred and ten thousand dollars for you know I mean kind of like the the Excel work the the PowerPoint work that a lot of uh, people who did that work may be familiar with. Uh, it seems like on a cursory glance that the labor market is very st- strong. And f- when I say strong, I mean strong for the workers. There's a lot of bargaining power for labor because there's so, so many more openings than there are workers available. Uh, and yet there's a great chart that you have in your report, uh, um, Jim, that real wages, as, as you alluded to earlier, are down. In other words, yes, wages are going up, but they're not going up as much as inflation. That's surprising to me, Jim, as someone who just sees the eighteen dollars an hour, and then uh, you know people who are doing PowerPoint are making all this money. Uh, like, what, what, why, why aren't wages? Why aren't wages keeping up with inflation? And what are the pockets of, of weakness where w- wages are not keeping up? You know, in, in particular with inflation. Yeah, actually, I'm in Chicago, and if you want an antidote, there's um, an Amazon fulfillment center outside of Chicago that's averaging that's advertising twenty three dollars an hour starting salary. The only qualification is you can pick up 50 pounds from the floor to your waist. If you could do that, you could start today at 23 bucks an hour plus a $3,000 signing bonus. And if you actually multiply all that out, it's $48,000 a year uh, for, the, for that job. Just walking off the street, you can start this afternoon uh, as well. So, yes, you are seeing a lot of wages going up. I would argue this gets a little bit more existential. And this gets to another thing that no one wants to really say out loud. So I'll say it out loud. Every generation has an economic event that defines that generation. The last last generation's economic event was the financial crisis. The one before that was the tech bust. This one's economic event was we sent everybody home for a year. And coming out of that, I think a lot of trends have changed. They have changed, and we don't understand that because you'll hear these code words. The, the code word on Wall Street, is, I don't get it, is when we return back to normal, when we return back to 2019. We're not. We're not going back to some pre-pandemic normal. We're going to go back to some other kind of new normal. I know it's an overused term. Uh, and do not mistake that for being dystopian. Uh, it's not, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Ultimately, I think what's happened is that we were on a, a trajectory to have more and more jobs be remote work, work from home, flexible hour type of work. But what happened from 2020's lockdowns is we sped it up by, I'll just throw out a number just to get my point across. We sped it up by 15 or 20 years. So we're, we're, we're now where we should have been in 2030. If you want, or 2035 or something like that. Uh, And so we are still struggling to understand, say, remote work. Uh, I got news for you. We're never going back to the office. Uh, The office, uh, the problem with the office is who is a modern, you're in New York, all those big, big, giant buildings that lots of people work in. Who's that designed for? That's designed for the executives of the, the, the CEO, the managing director types. That's who the office is designed for. Those are the types, the Dave Solomons of Goldman Sachs, who can't want, wait to get back to the office. Yeah, because it's designed for you. 75% of the people that work in those offices usually work in clerical jobs, operation jobs, administration jobs, or something along those lines. The office is not designed for them. They're perfectly fine by working at home if they can work at home. And this is the push-pull. And this is what's happened is 23 bucks an hour to work at Amazon, I, I don't want that job. That's why they got to pay it. People are just not – there. maybe, if you will, there was some kind of a, um, an, a, you know, an awakening, you know, like a uh, – 
in saying, look, life's too short. I don't want to go and, uh, you know, live the dystopian life. And what is the dystopian life? It was take the New Jersey Transit through the Port Authority. That was dystopian. Go to an office in Midtown Manhattan. It was maybe Class B or Class C office space and get a little 8x8 eight eight office with ceiling tiles that have water spots. Holy crap, what did I do to my life? And maybe after sitting at home for a year, I don't want that. Why do you think they got to pay first year bankers $110,000 a year? Because all of the New York City banks want them in the office five days a week, 10 hours a day, maybe on Saturday. So they have to bribe them. They have to outright bribe them. Here is, here's the great thing about this job. I pay a lot of money. Here's the bad thing about this job. I want you in this big building called an office, especially if you're JP Morgan. We just got done paying a billion dollars for this shiny new office that nobody wants. So I'm going to just bribe people to fill it up is what I'm going to have to do because you could take a job with another bank that pays you a little bit less, move to Jackson Hole, ski in the afternoon, ride horses in the summer, uh, you know, work from home. But or you can you can get a more money, but you got to come into this office. So we're having this struggle with what it means to have an office. What is the purpose of an office? How people want to work. There's a great anecdote on this about Dave Solomon of Goldman Sachs from 2020. It was this was in the Wall Street Journal. He was at some swanky Hampton eatery eatery in June of 2020, right in the middle of lockdowns. And a bunch, of, a bunch of associates from Goldman Sachs walked up and introduced themselves, said, hi, we're associates at Goldman Sachs. We were here having lunch. We saw you. We work for you. We wanted to introduce ourselves to him. And Solomon just unloaded on him. What are you doing here in the middle of the day? Why aren't you working? And, you know, it's basically what he barked back at him. Well, it's <laughs> why, are you, why are you here? <laughs> well, that's exactly what happened. He told his management staff at a board meeting that, and they said, what were you doing there, Dave? You know, and stuff, you know, it's okay for you to do that, but not everybody else. This is what we learned in the last year is I want quality of life and quality of life is not the Long Island Railroad or the New Jersey Transit. If you want people back in the office, you got to fix those things, I think, before you actually fix the office. And that's the part about the labor market. No one wants to get around. You know, no one wants to address it. And especially Wall Street, because they all work in the office in Midtown. And that you are like the only industry, Wall Street Midtowners, that are actually going back to the office. Everybody else isn't if they can't. Now, what I mean by that is, of course, surgeons have to go into a hospital. Waitresses have to go to a restaurant. Um, you know, policemen have to go walk a beat. They can't do it from Zoom. So those yeah. jobs. But, but about a third to half the jobs in the United States can have some version of remote work. And it doesn't seem like we're ready to just say, we are now a remote work world. Let's get rid of half our office space. Let's get, you know, but we still don't want to go there yet. We're not ready to. And it's largely because we got all these boomer managers that love the office that are not ready to admit that the, that we, things have changed permanently. And Jim, if it is the case that workers uh, who have the option of working from home sort of have to be bribed to come into the office. That seems like it would be very inflationary for wages. So how do you explain the, uh, uh, um, you know, the fact that wages have gone up? Yes, but inflation has gone up more than wages. How do you explain that? Because the, the adjunct to that is the other thing that Wall Street has gotten wrong, and that is the supply chain. That since the Wall Street became aware that there's these two words you could put together and have a meeting called supply and chain, they've yeah. immediately said since last spring, oh, the problems have peaked and we're past the worst. We're past the worst. And just keep saying it and eventually we will be. But that I've yet to see anybody on Wall Street that actually warned that there was going to be an intractable supply chain problem. Now, the reason I bring that up in those terms is if everybody's working at home, and if people are changing their lifestyle, the mix of things they buy has changed. And I think that is also a problem with the supply chain. We are being told that the people that import stuff are looking at their 2019 schedule of what people want and don't want, and they keep importing that. No, we've changed. We're working at home more. We're working remote more. We want more stuff. And since we're demanding more stuff, 
That's where the shortage comes in. I'll give you one other example. You hear another throwaway line. Oh, once we get, you know, past the supply chain problem, or excuse me, once we get past the uh, COVID and we get past the lockdowns, then we're going we're gonna to buy less stuff and we're going to want more experiences. That's a nowcast. And the reason I say that's a nowcast, two weeks ago, Stephen Squarey, he's the CEO of American Express, was on their, their uh, quarterly conference call. He said something we all know. Business travel is one-third of what it used to be pre-pandemic. I could attest to that. I'm in Chicago. Pre-pandemic, I went to New York about every six or eight weeks. I've been to New York three times in the last two years because there's no one to go see. You know, they, they like me, my customers, but they don't want me in their kitchen at 930 in the morning. So there's no one to go see. So business travel is one-third. Per, uh, personal travel is records, is off the charts. When you look at the TSA chart numbers of throughput at the airport, if business travels one third of what it used to be, how do we get back to 90%? Because that's where we're at, 90% of pre-pandemic. Because everybody's going to want experiences. Hello, they've been doing that since last summer. They've been traveling. They've been doing these experiences. They've been moving to give better experiences that has already occurred. That is a now cast. What you need to understand is now that they're remote, they need more and different stuff. And we're not ready like the, like the toilet paper industry to say, we need to make more of this. We need to make less of that. Again, we're just sitting there going, just sit there and don't do anything. And eventually the supply chain will resolve itself. And maybe we'll even have some kind of glut on the other side. Well, that, that will only be a glut and stuff that we don't want, but there will always be stuff that we want. So even though we're getting more money, we're already spending it on services, we're spending it on remote work, and we're demanding more stuff. So prices are going up more than wages. So you're not keeping up. But if you're in the upper 10% of the country, Oh, my spiders went up. My house went up. I'm already up. If you're in the bottom half of the country, you don't have spiders. You don't have a house. And you're just grumbling that, yeah, I got a raise. But, man, these prices just keep going up and up and up and they don't stop. And that we need to start having that conversation about reorienting the production chain, reorienting the supply chain to the new post-pandemic reality. But instead, we keep insisting that we're going to return to normal. We're going to go back to 2019, and we're not. And the sooner we start to understand that, I think the better we'll be at, at going about correcting the imbalances in the economy. Jim, when you said uh, spiders, that's uh, like the S&P sector ET ETFs, uh, what would you, did you uh, talk about nowcast? I've heard of GDP nowcast, but can you just describe what you meant when you, you said that? Well, there, the nowcast is kind of a pejorative word. There's forecast, right? A forecast is mm -hmm. telling you what I think is going to happen. Then there's backcast, and that's telling you what has happened. Nowcast is, um, I think I heard John Stewart first invent this word. Nowcast is, tell me what happened five minutes ago, but pretend like you're giving me a prediction about the future. Ah. That's what yeah. a nowcast is. So tell me that people are going to unleash experiences. They have been for six months. And you say it like it's about to happen. Sorry, it's been happening for six months already. American Express has already told us that. Go to the airport. I, I did have a business trip last week, and the airport was pretty full. It wasn't full of you know, people with me wearing blazers. It was full of families Going on vacation is what it was full of or or, you know, so understand that the, that unleashing of experiences that has already been occurring and has been occurring in record amounts. And Jim, I'd, I'd note that even though the TSA throughput, the amount of travelers is at 90 percent of where it was, the, the co change of composition from business travelers to personal people for, for, for enjoyment, for vacation, that is really important for uh, airlines bottom line because a lot of business travelers worked for this big company they were an executive and sure they paid three hundred dollars extra for a business because they weren't paying for it. it it was their company and they just you know got got a receipt back but if you're i mean trading uh you know uh on a personal journey like the, it's it's to a lot of people who you know who, who are not you know uh wealthy people like three hundred dollars to trade to go in business class versus 
coach. It's just it's it's a bad trade to a lot of people. So that's and that's business class is how airlines make all their money. So that's that's an example example of just you know a small imbalance that yeah we're at ninety percent but there's just a little bit of a change. And you know keep in mind that when you travel as a family, you're right. You're, there's three hundred bucks for business class. Well, that's for me. Then there's my wife and my two kids. I'm not about to pay an extra twelve hundred dollars to put all of them um, in business class. And if you want one other antidote, I haven't seen a breakdown of this, but it, it just happens that in the last couple of weeks, I've gone to both New York and the plane was half full. And I actually went to a conference in Florida and on both ends of the uh, conference uh, going to Florida, I kept getting texts from uh, the airline United that if I wanted to change my flight because it was overbooked, that uh, there, there were all these other options. So it's it's like, you know, at some point they're going to have to start realizing you're going to have to start pulling off planes from the Chicago to uh, New York route and maybe adding those planes to the Chicago to Fort Lauderdale or Miami or Tampa or Orlando routes because that seems to be the, the, the tact we're going. And I suspect that the airlines are still hesitant to do that because we're going to open up and all these people in blazers like me are going to show up paying an extra $300 and not care because it's on an expense report and we can't have those planes not ready for them. Well, you know, they're going to have to start to realize games changed, but we're not having those discussions, which is why I think is supply, why I think the frictions and the imbalances of inflation are going to be sticky and they're going to stick around a lot more. And as people scream and yell that this is intolerable, these high prices, the Federal Reserve comes under more and more pressure to do something about it, which is raise rates a lot. And Jim, one of those imbalances yeah, in inflation is the housing market uh, on an absolute tear in 2020, 2021, and perhaps 2022 as well. And housing prices are, of course, different than rent. And rent is a component of CPI or consumer price inflation. Jim, recently I learned from you something that absolutely blew my mind just about the shelter CPI. Could you could you share that with, with our audience and why it may indicate that shelter CPI inflation may be a lot stickier and a lot higher than some anticipate? So 30% of inflation is, this, is the shelter component, right? It's your house inflation, it's utilities, insurance, upkeep of your house, the inflation rate among that, that's 30%. By far the biggest part of that, 25 of the 30%, is what's called owner's equivalent rent or rents of primary residence. They're the same thing, one's for homes, one's for rental units. How do they calculate uh, owner's equivalent rent? Uh, they do a survey of rental units across the country, and they ask them how much you're getting for rent relative to what you used to get before. Now, pre-pandemic, rents didn't move that much. So they would actually survey, they have these, all of these rental units, single family homes, multi-unit, uh, you know, geographically dispersed. And by the way, the, the, the side note I like to say is, if you are one of these rental units, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement with the BLS. You can't tell anybody that you're a rental unit. Why? Because the, the joke I like to say is if everybody knew who the rental units were, well, Goldman Sachs would buy them all and then they would set OER wherever they wanted and that's a quarter of inflation. Uh, so yeah. we don't know who they are um, it's specifically. But they tell you, you know, we've got these in the South and in the Northeast and the Midwest and the West, um, you know, and stuff. And so they only survey them twice a year because rents didn't move that much. And now let me be clear, they've got a survey sample, right? They survey one sixth of the sample every month. So after six months, the whole survey sample has been done. So when the January payroll report comes out this week, what the, the numbers from what was six months earlier, August come out, the people that they surveyed in August will be surveyed again in January. So then that will get updated probably with higher prices, one sixth with higher prices. But the and Jim, sorry, this is this is the CPI report that comes out tomorrow, which would be February 10th. We're recording on February yes, 9th. Yes, yeah, the yeah. owner's equivalent rent. So what I'm trying to say is owner's equivalent rent and shelter inflation is very slow moving. So, you know, if if rents are up a lot now, it's going to take five more months after January to survey everybody in the survey everybody in the universe to, to reflect those higher prices. The point is, most people that looked at this say that 25 or 30% of inflation that's shelter is going to go up all year. 
and it's going to provide an underpin for the inflation rate. So when you look at the inflation rate, there's a narrative out there that I don't think is going to work in that narrative. Well, I think it's true, but it's not going to work. The narrative is we expect inflation to peak in the first quarter or second quarter, like March, April, May. Why? Because last year, March's number was 0.6. April's number was 0.9. May's number was 0.6. So this year... That, that's month over month, right? That's or, month, so that's yeah, month yeah. over month. So this year's March, April, May numbers better be 0 0.6, 0 0.9, 0 0.6. Or if they come in slightly lower than that, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 you'll see a peak in the year-over-year -year rate and it'll start down. And what people want to say is, it peaked, it peaked, that's it. It's all over with. There's no more inflation. 5,200 in the S&P, stop the rate hikes. Transitory, I win. Jim, I said, I've been calling transitory for a year. I win. Right, right. <laughs> but the real, the real narrative in the second half of the year is not going to be that it peaks in April or May. We all know that's going to happen. I know that's going to happen. How fast does it come down? And if you have shelter continuing to go up and it's a quarter of inflation, the answer is it's going to come down slow. So if you think it's going to be down around 4% at the end of the year and go, see, it went from 7 to 4, that 4 is still unacceptable. 4 means 5 rate hikes in QT. Maybe 2 means 3 rate hikes and no QT. But if you think it's going to peak at 7.5 by April and fall all the way to 4 by the end of the year, that's 5 rate hikes this year in QT. That's way too much inflation. That, that derivative that it peaks and it's going to start down is not enough to, to change the narrative, I don't think. And it's going to keep the pressure on the Fed. And well, what about 23? Want to come down in 23? Let's go back to politics. Jay's going to fix the problem. And Jay has to fix the problem, fix it in the past tense by the second week in November. If he fixes it in 23, it doesn't do any good. So Jay, get on it now is what he's going to have to do. Uh, and I think people really underestimate the political pressure that the Fed is under. Jim, I know you're, you're a macro thinker, but let's just strictly, uh, uh, strictly zoom in on equities now. You've seen big drawdowns in you know, what could be called speculative growth stocks. Uh, value stocks have been outperforming growth stocks. And you know, technology stocks have not been faring great, although some big cap tech, tech names have been, have been faring, faring well. Um, I don't know what the S&P 500 is at a drawdown, you know, perhaps close to close to 10%. I believe at one time, intraday, it was at a 10% drawdown. NASDAQ, comprised of te more, more technology names, more growth names, has a, a bigger drawdown, something like 15%. Um, how, are you, how are you thinking of this equity market, market volatility? And all, by the way, vol in there, I was using volatility as a, as a uh, synonym uh, or a euphemism for stocks going down. And so I'm guilty of that. Um, but yeah, and, everybody you know, what's uses your, it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's your, what, you know, what's, your, what's your forward outlook? So let's talk about the equity market in one respect. If you talk to your neighbors or your friends or something along those lines, you know, you know, meetings at school or at church, and you start talking about the stock market, the stock market for the public, I'd like to say is nine tickers. That's all it is. It's, it's the S&P ETF. That's the big thing. It's a handful of racy fang type non-profitable growth stocks plus ARC and maybe the options on it. And then there's 6,000 other stocks, which we'll call everything else. And that's pretty much the way the public is. Because I can't tell you how many people I say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm big into the stock market. What do you own? SPY. You know, that's basically all they own. They're, that's that's all they need to own. They don't need to waste time thinking about healthcare stocks relative to energy stocks, relative to financials, relative to consumer discretionary, or even pick a manager that makes those decisions for them. So what's happened is the stock market has become ETF flows. And I've joked that prior to this year, you know, I, um, internally on our little Slack message board, I used to say, quick check, is there still electricity on the New York Stock Exchange floor? And if the answer is yes, money's flowing in and stock prices are going to go up because all it's going to do is people are going to commit to the market. And that means buy spiders. And please, Mr. Active Manager, get out of the way so I can buy SPY. Unfortunately, you know, for those active managers, that's the way the world works. Oh, but you got to do something more than that. OK, I'll buy some options on Tesla or I'll buy some options on NVIDIA or Apple or Amazon or something like that um, and YOLO and, you know, and see how that works out. 
But that's pretty much it. So you had an unusual circumstance in 2021. Of all of the major indices, the Dow, all the Russell indices, all the NASDAQ indices and the like, the best performing index was the S&P 500. Now, it's almost never the best performer. It's almost always in the middle, somewhere else. One of the extremes performs better, you know, small caps or, or the Dow or NASDAQ, but it was the S&P. And I said, because that's where all the money is. Everybody buys the index and it jams the index higher um, as well. So that's how we invest. The result of that is if you look at any metric of valuation, there's two answers you can give. That the stock market is at some level of overvaluation. You can either say extremely or slightly, but overvaluation, or you could, or you could lie and say it's not. <laughs> Because it, it is, whether you look at market cap to GDP, forward P.E. ratios, um, whatever other measure you want to pick, price to book or whatever, I think it's overvalued. Uh, and, and now that you are in an overvalued market and you've got a tightening Fed, higher inflation and higher market based long 10 year interest rates, that puts more pressure on the market. So what you've seen happen is it's starting to crumble. The Russell 2000 had a media defined bear market by the end of January last week, it fell 20% from its November 8th high. Um, the Nasdaq composite down 15%, non-profitable tar non-profitable stocks or ARC are down more than 50% at the same time, but the S&P only went down 9% and it's down like 4 as we're talking right now or maybe 5 somewhere in that range. And the reason from all time is, highs, because it's up from today all time on, highs, on, on, which was night. January yeah, yeah. 3rd, which was January 3rd, by the way, was the all time high. And why is the S&P perform better than everything else? Because that's the stock market, SPY or uh, equivalent S&P index ETF is the stock market. And that's how money keeps flowing into it. But if we continue to see rate hikes, struggling markets, uh, I mean, rate hikes, a flattening yield curve, higher long-term interest rates. And eventually, if the public decides, you know, this is not the place for me, maybe there is an interest rate in a bond fund or in a money market fund or something that's some non-zero number that I think competes with a struggling market, I think competes with a struggling market, and those flows turn, then the market's in, then the S&P We'll start looking more like the Russell or the Nasdaq. Even as we've had the, this a tough time for stocks in January, it hasn't just been the the Fang stocks holding up the index. I note the exception with the F in there. Facebook has has definitely uh, uh, suffered suffered. But also, I'd say industrial cyclical names, commodity stocks, in particular the energy sector. I think there was a time when the energy sector XLE was the only spider S and P five hundred sector that was up uh, year to date. How, how have you made, made sense of that? And then also, you know, I've uh, seen you post on Twitter you know, recently a chart about aluminum. Commodities just seem to be in a, in a huge bull market. Does that have more to do with supply than, than, than demand? Yeah, so um, you're right. I think that uh, to that extent, the public plows money into um, um, SPY. But there's still trillions of dollars that's actively managed. Uh, even though their flows might be slow. And those trillions of dollars have actively managed have decided that they need to play inflation beneficiaries. What is an inflation? If you could drop it on your toe, buy it, right? Aluminum is an example of that. So they're buying, they're buying industrials. They're buying basic materials. They're buying miners. They're buying those type, uh, maybe even going straight into commodity funds uh, as well too. They're buying energy. So they're buying a lot of the things that would benefit from higher inflation is, is what they're doing right now. And that's how, how I would explain to you that that's where it's going. So if you ask me beyond just in or out of the stock market, if I had to be in, yeah, I'd still weight myself towards inflation beneficiaries. I still think that that's going to be a, a, a viable story. And why, again, are inflation beneficiaries? I think it comes back to post-pandemic. We want more stuff. We want more stuff because our lifestyles changed. We're more home. And more home means I need more things at home uh, as well, too. And that is putting pressure on commodities, which is the raw material to make that stuff uh, as well, too.
Mm-hmm. Jim, and if you uh, had to choose an area of the market that you're, you're not constructive on, uh, I know you t- you've mentioned offices, so that's commercial real estate, and then airlines as well. Uh, w- between offices, uh, airlines, and then let's say ARC, uh, which would you be most inclined to, to be bearish uh, against? And of course, you know, not investment advice. Actually, I am a registered rep, so I can give investment advice. Uh, I think office real estate is a real problem. Let me go off the board and say, if there's another thing I hate, and I'm not alone with this, is it is the financials. Uh, yes, now, yes. the financials can wind up being a good rental, and I'll use that word that, you know, maybe they're going to go up. They've done well in the last few months. But let's talk about financials in a bigger picture. In the last 25 years, the last 15 years, the last 10 years. If you look at the 11 sectors of the S&P 500, who's in last place? Who's been the worst performer? Financials. And within financials, who's been among the worst performers has been the big banks. They've been terrible performers. As I've quipped in a couple of times, I said, why did God invent money center bank stocks? It's to make fund managers former fund managers. And it's done a pretty damn good job of that over the last couple of years. Anybody remember Eddie Lempert? You know, to give you one name um, down down the list uh, yeah. as well, too. There was a time when he was the next Buffett. And I haven't heard yeah. his name in many, many years. Uh, well, also, as, Sears, right? He's the Sears guy. Yes, he's the Sears yeah, Land's yeah, yeah. End guy and stuff like that. But financials have been an awful, awful performer. And you wouldn't, you'd be mistaken for knowing it because one of the things, if you watch financial TV too much like me, you know, never ending, you know, fund managers come on and, oh, I love the financials. Why? Because you're looking for another job or you actually think that they're actually a good investment idea. Uh, and so what I think the market has been signaling with this terrible underperformance of financials is their business model doesn't really work. Oh, but they make a lot of money. Oh, you know, oh, their cash flows are great. So why do they suck as investments if they make a lot of money and their cash flow is great? And especially when you get to European and Japanese banks, do you know if you bought the Japanese, if you bought the Japanese uh, bank index the day after the stock market crash of 87, 35 years ago, you are almost 35 years ago, you are still underwater. You are still underwater right now, 35 years later. If you bought Deutsche Bank today, you are buying it at the same level it was at in 1983 when it was in a different country in a different currency. It was in West Germany and it was priced in Deutschmarks, not Euros. And Nina's 99 left balloons was the number one hit in the country uh, at, at that point. And so that stock has done nothing in 30 years. And that you could go up and down the line that the financials have been JP Morgan and various levels of suck is the way you can pretty much define them. Now, why is it? I've, all right, I've blasted the financials enough. Why is it that they've been so bad? Market is signaling, I think, that their business model is ripe for disruption. Why hasn't it been disrupted? Because they've got all of these three and four letter agencies, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, on down the line, that their job is to protect that broken business model and not let them be disrupted. But now, meaning in the last couple of years and going forward, we might have a business model that can overcome that regulatory moat that they've built, and that's decentralized finance. And so I ultimately think that, yes, the banks could be a decent rental if you think the yield curve is going to steepen or if you think interest rates are going to go up and it's going to help their net interest rate margins and stuff. But... If you haven't been completely burned on owning banks or financials, just hang in there and you will. Uh, you, because that business model is, uh, I, if I can be any more clear that I'm not a fan of, of, of their business model. Their business models have to change. And uh, they, they, they have to change and they have to change in a big way. But they don't feel like they need to change because they've got the Fed and the FDIC and the SEC now doing their bidding. Oh, here's somebody who wants to disrupt the model. We can't have that. We can't have that. We can't have any change on them. Look, you could say the same thing about the taxicab business. The taxicab business for for decades, this this business model just doesn't work. It, it's, a, it's a bad business model. But anytime somebody came along, the city councils and the mayor would eventually put the kibosh on any kind of a of a modernization or a revamp of the business model. And then an unstoppable force came called Uber and ride sharing more general, you know, let's throw a lift in there too. 
as well. And and then even though they had city councils and mayors trying to uh, outlaw it and ban it and everything else, they just couldn't at the end of the day and they were forced to change. And I think that the financial system is, you know, is going to be forced to change one way or the other because of these new these new decentralized finance protocols that are coming. So I'm not a big fan of the financial industry, recognizing they still might do okay in the first half of this year, but it's a rental. It's not a long-term play. Mm, yeah, yeah, Jim, uh, for viewers who don't know, you are probably the, the most uh, into DeFi of, of any TradFi guy I know. Um, you very quite early to it as well. Uh, you have a lot, you, you know, you're pretty deep, you're deep in the DeFi rabbit hole. Uh, the reason you and I have spoken about, you know, mostly TradFi in this interview is because you're going to be speaking uh, with Jason Yenowitz, the co-founder of Blockworks on his podcast, uh, Empire, later on in the month. So viewers, definitely uh, uh, stay tuned for that. What year roughly do you think that the the average loan is like, is construct is, is, is uh, um, originated via a DeFi protocol rather than a, a traditional TradFi bank? I'm going to answer the question by saying an average loan is, I take that to mean an unsecured loan. If that's the answer, maybe never, uh, because it's going to be very difficult to get unsecured lending in a DeFi protocol, in a permissionless protocol, because there's no collateral backing that up. Now, there's efforts to try and bring that in the place in the DeFi space, and we'll see whether or not they work uh, as well. But... If you're talking about collateralized lending, uh, if you're talking uh, about trading, uh, if you're talking about you know pure uh, token lending and borrowing and stuff like that, that will all be done in the DeFi protocol. Let me back up for a second. Considering I'm going to assume that you know we get a lot of TradFi people listening here, it's all just magic coins trading back and forth that have no purpose. Well, the purpose is starting to come in the Focus And the purpose is what's referred to as the metaverse or Web3. Oh, yeah, but that's, those are fancy words that have no meaning. And that's somewhat true. But let me give you a meaning for that. The problem right now is under Web2, the platform companies, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters, uh, the YouTubes, uh, Instagrams. I know that some of those are owned by some of those other companies as well, too. How, what do we do all day long on social media? me, you, everybody else. We create content on Twitter or on YouTube, or we create content on Facebook or LinkedIn in order to enrich Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. They make the money off of it. We don't. Now, eventually, if it get to a level, they'll throw me some crumbs with some kind of advertising bonus or something like that. But in a Web3 world, you will own your content you will be able to monetize your content directly. And if you look at the value of all the Web2 protocols, the Googles, the Facebooks, that's, that's many, many trillions of dollars. The financial system for the new Web3 world will be DeFi, is what it will be. So the banking system will look at, wow, there's this new line of business that's going to be trillions of dollars of lending and borrowing and trading, and you're not going to get any of it. It's going to be all to the DeFi world. And then that is going to be the grease that's going to allow this new protocol. You own your own data. You own your own content world to exist. Now, when am I going to get a car loan on DeFi? When am I going to get a mortgage on DeFi? Whenever somebody can solve, truly solve, how do I permissionlessly do it so that I can connect and get a car loan without knowing whether or not I have a car or who I am. I don't know how you can do that. So you're still probably going to have to go to a traditional bank to do that. But the traditional bank is going to change in a lot of ways because of DeFi. So we're still going to need them. And we're still going to need those loans. But when it comes to you and me that are more in the content creation business, I look forward to the day I can own. You look forward to the day that you can own the Forward Guidance YouTube page and you can directly find a value for that page. I can own the Bianco Research page. Instead, now we just throw up content, make YouTube rich, and they maybe kick us back some crumbs in the form of advertising, but they make a lot more off of us than we make off of us. And that's what it's attempting to try and fix. Mm. 
Jim, it's always fascinating get, uh, getting to talk with you. You've been very generous with your time. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, people, your, you know, uh, your firm, uh, Bianca Research, on Twitter, you are at Bianca Research. People should definitely uh, check out your work. Jim, thank you so much. Thank you.